I remember in Delhi airport, I have a friend with an elderly Punjabi gentleman, and he's a very interested in philosophy and also is a sort of air traffic controller. So each time I go there, I, I call someone in Air India staff and say, is my friend there, Mr. Prithvi Singh? And they call him and he comes and he takes me for coffee. And then we start on our philosophical conversation that we had three months before. And one day he came and he says, you know, my father died and I just can't accept. Someone who is so good, this, the world is totally unjust. I just cannot accept that. Well, just the shock, and the pain is simply because of completely not being away from reality. And so then I try, you know, as, as humbly and gently as I could to tell him the story of, uh, of a time of, the, of, of, of Lord Buddha, of, of a woman whose young child had just died uh, in infancy. And she brought the child to the Buddha and said, please bring him back to life. And the Buddha said, if you bring me the earth from any of the home in the village where nobody died, then maybe. And so she went round and then she came back and she said, I, I understood. There's no any place where, here where nobody ever died. So it is not just an intellectual pursuit to meditate on impermanence. It is the way to be more understanding about reality and therefore our whole sort of, it, it, inf it, it sort of uh, influences so much the quality of our perception, the mechanism of happiness and suffering. And so that's it matters. So another way to transform one's mind is to more a contemplative approach, a contemplative meditation. Now when we have understood through analytical meditation, said that impermanence is a natural way of phenomena, then we can not just have an intellectual thing, like reading uh, a manual for, for, for flying and never ever get into aeroplane or reading endlessly you know, advertisement for you know, tropical islands you know, that doesn't really is quite the same as sitting on the beach there so at some or, or like uh, piling up the prescription of the doctor by one's pillow you know, hoping that we are going to cure that doesn't work so there's definitely a stage of integration through contemplative meditation, which means once this understanding is quite clear, and quite deep, then to sort of sit with it or remain with it. So it's sort of the time it takes for, you see like if you have your flower pot and you need to uh, water it. Now when it's quite dry, maybe you put it handful, I mean, the bucket of water, and then it, it takes time to soak in. But if you put water and immediately pour it out, you know, just a little bit of the surface, it will not soak in the earth, so the plant will not grow. So we do have those feelings of loving kindness, compassion, some glimpse of understanding about impermanence, and then suddenly we go to something else. So that doesn't really become part of ourselves. It's like if you learn to ski, by, by doing it 15 seconds every week. You know, it's never going to know how to ski. So you have really to, how could that happen? Everything in the world comes for in our life comes through, through training. You know, nobody knows how to read, to write, to walk, to talk when we're born and we, we learn that. Then we learn a professional skill. We learn to play chess, we learn to ski. And everything we understand is meant for, for training. And, and we are ready to do so many things precisely for that. But the Tibetan saying that say that people have the stars as hat and morning frost as boots, meaning that they are up late at night, early in the morning, just to, to do with great effort what they have to do in life. And we are ready to do so much even to, for fitness. You know, if, if, if someone from the jungle will come and see someone in their home riding like crazy on this bicycle that goes nowhere, 
Is he, is he, what is he doing? He's trying to get fit, healthy, lose a few kilos. So there's a goal, and, and we don't mind riding this bicycle that you know, not even go to the kitchen. <laughs> so, but we would assume that the small brat that runs a walk in our mind, the mind itself, is going to be trained to be peaceful, to be compassionate, just like that? Why? This is, will be a, a unique phenomena that we will get this stability, inner peace, inner strength, inner freedom, all those other characteristic clusters of human quality that qualify genuine happiness, just because one wishes to be happy? Well, that, how could that ever happen like that? So now, we, we are sort of hesitant about starting something, this kind of inertia. People sometimes say, oh, it's not very really healthy to look in your mind. You know, it's like, you better do something, you know, socialize, and do something for others, or learn something, distract yourself, you know, go for jogging. And just don't sit there looking at your mind. <laughs> and then also people are scared sometimes. They say, I met someone who's a, 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 a Japanese astronomer, you know, a quite a, he looks very sort of stable and is in charge of a big project in Hawaii to build a giant telescope. And he said, it takes a lot of courage to look within oneself. Then I met a young Californian who said the same thing. I don't long want to look within myself. I'm afraid of what I'm going to find there. So I mentioned that to his son, the Dalai Lama, and he said, how come? It's more interesting than going to movie. <laughs> so much happening, so interesting. But still, you know, Mark, Marcus Aurelius said that this is the most sort of noble act activity is to, to investigate and look within, to look within oneself. That's how you can unravel the mechanism of happiness and suffering. And people also say it's a selfish, it's a very egoistic uh, you know, way of spending one time. Well, not quite. Because what will happen when you start honestly, and in that case you really have to be honest, because what you want to, what you want to do is noticing that nothing is absolutely perfect in your life. You want to really try to achieve a, a better quality of being. You know, this is the justification for transformation. If, if we have some kind of sickness, it doesn't help to say, oh, I'm, I'm not interested. You know, some people say that Buddhist teachings are pessimistic because the Buddha first taught about suffering. It's all about suffering. Well, what a doctor does, is he a pessimistic person? When he, he's helping you to see if you are healthy or he helps you to diagnose a sickness that you might have, he's not pessimistic. He's just trying to precisely identify the cause of your ailments and cure you. So that's actually a very optimistic way is that there is a cause for your problem and there is a, a solution for it and a cure for it. But for that, we need to be earnest in finding out our presence. And there's nothing wrong in finding out that we are a mixture of happiness and suffering, of quality and defects, of light and shadows. That's, 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 that's fine. But now if we say there's nothing but sometimes you read people, it's absolutely nothing I want to change in myself. My life is perfect, and there's nothing I could think of changing. I have a young Tibetan friend of mine who has a very sharp mind, and sometimes he doesn't mind sort of hitting at the key issues. He says, well, if you think that everything is absolutely perfect in your life, either you are enlightened, or you are a little bit stupid. 